I've heard everyone, you know, or a lot of people talk about this. Uh, uh, I've heard people like Spielberg say, you know, when you come across something um, that interests you or inspires you, maybe you don't know all the reasons at the moment why you want to make it, but you don't really need to know. You can kind of explore it through the the creative process. So I guess I had that. I had the, you know, kind of the hairs tingling on the back of my neck. Uh, I know it was a very, I knew it was a very dark book, but. Um, there was something in there, and after thinking about it, um, after making it and thinking about it, I think um, what it really is is, uh, you know, in addition to the great writing and the great way that it was, the book was structured and the and the unusual character portrait is that um, it was a way to talk about things that I thought that I think are universal. You know, this need for. Um, uh, a connection with a, a, an other, someone outside of ourselves, uh, the need to love and be loved. Um, you know, that, that it was a movie about that, but it told it in a very kind of extreme and unusual way, basically through uh, necrophilia. And so, um, as, a, as a filmmaker, uh, I thought that that was, you know, those were all the reasons I wanted to make movies, you know, make something new, but something that uh, people can relate to. Yeah, I mean, it is a very uh, singular film. I think it's probably the, the cinema's um, uh, greatest portrait of necrophilia ever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, to what extent did the book? Um, did you subtract or add things to the book? I'm not familiar with the book. Uh, um, I'm guessing it's not a very long novel. Um, but were there things that you, that you expanded upon? Uh, or was it more a case of subtraction? Um, the, the approach here, I've, I've adapted a few books now. Um, some, uh, I did one from Faulkner, As I Lay Dying, and um, I uh, used... Poetry, Hart, Hart Crane's poetry for a film. So I've done it a few times now, and um, it's always there's always a question of how loyal you'll be to your, the source, and then in what ways will you be loyal. So our approach was yes, we will. You know, we love the book, and we want to um, translate it to the screen in as. Um, honorable ways, or, or, or honor the source as, as much as we can. So, um, everything, almost every scene in the movie you could find, you can find in the book. As far as the, um, except for the scene where um, Lester shoots the um, stuffed animals, that is not in the, the stuffed animals are in the book, but they, he doesn't have his kind of uh, breakdown moment and, and um, where he shoots them, and um, I love that. That's one of my favorite scenes, um, and it really just came out of um, the fact that we were there shooting, and it was a movie that had a lone protagonist. And so these stuffed animals that he talks to really kind of took on roles in the film, and they um, and we get coverage of them as if they were you know live characters, and. Um, and so during the filming, I just felt like, wow, we need closure with these people, with these characters. And um, also, it would be a great way to show Lester, you know, coming unhinged. And it was a, it was a way that he could kind of externalize a lot of his feelings with that scene. So that was the main scene that is not in the in the book. Otherwise, um, we we stayed pretty close to it. We did. There's a there's a there's more. At the end of the book, there's a bit of an epilogue that talks about Lester's fate. But essentially, um, that, that we shot, but I lopped it off because essentially it, it seemed to me that it was what the epilogue in the book was doing was telling or, or relating one of Cormac McCarthy's main themes, which is this kind of recurrence of violence or just that violence, there's something inherently violent about humans, and, and, and so he will layer his books with 
violence, but also traces of, of violence throughout history. And so the ending of the book talked about Lester going to an institution and then meeting um, another man who did even crazier things and ate people's brains with a spoon. And, and so it was, to me it was a way of saying, well, all right, you just saw, you just heard this story of this one guy, but then he, it doesn't end with him. It's been going on and other people, you know, it's, it, it happens all over and maybe it will continue to happen. And, um, and so I guess I thought it was a cleaner and more kind of um, poetic ending to just have Lester kind of disappear into the wilderness and it would kind of tell the same idea that, you know, he's gone through all this and, um, and he's still, his spirit is still out there. Um, just one more question before I take questions from the press. Um, this is a film that's a real kind of tour de force for, for Scott Hayes, the actor who plays uh, Lester. And I'm curious as to uh, how you work together in terms of developing the performance. Did the book serve as a kind of instruction uh, manual for the performance to, to some degree? And uh, how did you work with him to develop his diction, his physicality? The, I mean, it's a really a, a extraordinary performance that, that has qualities of kind of a, a child, but also qualities of an animal, ultimately. And I'm, I'm just interested in how you worked with with uh, Scott Walker to develop this. Scott Hayes, yeah. Um, Scott, Scott Walker yeah. is a singer, and Scott Hayes. Yeah, um, thank you so much, and I, I completely agree with you, and I would say that um, I'm well aware that it's you know a movie with disturbing subject matter that is not for not for everyone, and, and but I think one thing I don't think anyone that that has eyes can deny is that Scott gives an incredible performance, and um, so I'm I'm very proud that that exists, and um, I've known Scott for uh, over ten years. He's a friend of a, a friend. Uh, the actor Jim Parrick from True Blood is is, is Scott Hayes' childhood friend, and. So I met Scott, and, and, and um, over the 10 years, I saw Scott go through uh, some very dark personal things in his life. And he was, uh, he was kind of the friend of the friend that I didn't really want to spend much time with for a long time. Uh, he was just kind of crazy. And, um, and then he kind of came through all that and uh, became a better man uh, on the other side. And, um, and so when I finally got the rights to the book, um, uh, I saw that Scott was a dependable kind of person, and so I, I thought uh, I could have the best of both worlds. He could draw on his dark personal experiences as an actor, but as a director, I could, you know, uh, depend on him to be a, you know, professional and and um, not be a liability trying to make the movie, but you know, would be a, an ally making this movie and. Um, and it was also, I also knew that um, it was a role, I mean, it was a role that I could, um, when, I, when I first read the book, I imagined maybe Sam Rockwell in the role, or I, you know, uh, Michael Shannon has become a good friend of mine, but I, <laughs> uh, I guess I already, I already cast Michael Shannon in a necrophilia role uh, for a short film at NYU called Herbert White, but I thought, well, let's cast somebody that people don't know, you know, not, not that, you know, everyone, anyone will think, oh, it's really like a mountain man he found or something, but it'll just help the um, suspension of, of disbelief uh, even more if it's just like, wow, who is this guy? And uh, is he really like that? You know, uh, I, and so I, and then I knew that if I put Scott in this role, you know, he was at a place in his career where, you know, you just, you see this with a lot of actors. There's like the one role where they just go for it, you know, like, uh, they just go to extremes to prepare. And I knew that Scott was ready to do, to do that. And uh, so he, as soon as I cast him, he went to Tennessee. Um, we didn't ultimately shoot in Tennessee, but the, the story takes place in, in Sevier County, Tennessee, where 
I guess McCarthy lived for a while. And so Scott went out there and isolated himself for three months before we shot. He met, his friend actually ended up being the historian of Sevier County. So he, I guess he met, you know, the locals and moonshiners and learned how to operate that rifle and, um, and really worked on, you know, the accent and, um, and, and actually, I guess, I don't, I wasn't with him, but I guess he lived, he stayed overnight in actual caves <laughs> on his own. Uh, um, and, um, and so when I got to West Virginia, where we ultimately shot, um, Scott was, you know, fully in character, and uh, I, you know, as a director, I tamper with something like a performance, don't. If it's all working, just step back and let it let it be. And he, you know, I, I hadn't seen him in three months, and I walked into his hotel room the day before shooting, and uh, it was like the, you know, Lester was born. It was like he was in his little cocoon about ready to come out, and it was, he was just a different... He was, he was Lester, <laughs> basically. Okay, let's uh, get some questions from Yes. Um, James, could you talk a little bit about your fascination with necrophilia? It's a serious question. You've made a short film and now you've made a, a feature on it. Just what does that mean to you and why do you want to show it to us? Uh, were you able to hear that question? No, but just... I, I mean, well, I can repeat it if you didn't hear it. I guess you didn't hear it. Um, no, I, I, no, I can't hear him, sorry. Yeah, okay. The question was um, about, um, could you talk about your um, um, interest or fascination with necrophilia? You've made a, a short film about it and, and now um, a feature-length film about, about it, or in which it features. Um, it's a serious question, not, not a frivolous question. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, okay. Um, it's true, uh, there is a weird pattern, and um, in fact, uh, Early in my um, writing life, before even the short at NYU, I, I wrote a strange script about a, a man who works in a morgue and um, has uh, friendships with all the, the bodies that, that come in. It's not necrophilia, but, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's on that somebody commu commuting with the dead. And, um, and I think really for me, you know, I, I have no, I'm, in my personal life, I'm absolutely... <laughs> not attracted to dead people or anything like that. I, you know, I, um, I think what it is, is that if I look at some of the other projects I've directed, um, it, it hasn't plan been planned this way, but I do deal with characters who are either isolated and or um, live, you know, live, have a very um, rich imaginative uh, imaginative life and so um, in the case of Hart Crane there's a character who was isolated uh, his work you know did not fit with the uh, uh, the work of the day the modernist kind of writers of the day and um, so was isolated that way and, and so very much lived in his imagination uh, in his case you know you could see it blooming into poetry um, and I, I kind of view Lester in the same way. Um, not that he's an, an artist, but maybe he's a, a stand-in for someone who is unable to kind of fit into civilized society, but he wants um, a connection with another so badly that when he stumbles a, a, upon this opportunity, he figures out that he can have a relationship with someone outside of him if he animates it with, with his imagination. And so I guess, I guess it, for me it's just a very, necrophilia is an extreme way, like I was saying earlier, it's an extreme way to talk about um, things that we all want, you know, a connection with another. And, um, and it's, and it's a, an extreme way to show someone living in their own kind of imaginary world. Yes. And sometimes, and, and why do it in an extreme way? Well, um, sometimes 
um, I guess to uh, quote, you know, some people from uh, my uh, literary education, and, you know, like Schlossky talks about, you know, making the familiar unfamiliar. And so, like, like in Lolita, you know, Humbert Humbert is a monster on the outside, but the feelings on the inside, you know, his deep love for Lolita are, you know, you could say the same kind of love that, you know, uh, people in a, in a relationship we condone would, would have. So I'm not condoning necrophilia, it's just an extreme way to examine universal feelings. Another question, yeah. Yeah, you. Are we going to have a mic now this time? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, I've had the fortune to see this and also Kink and Interior Leather Bar recently and uh, Broken Tower, uh, which I thought was fantastic. And I, I notice a pattern with you that you, uh, it's kind of in a way almost pure anarchism. Like you are really kind of seem to be fascinated with the outcasts, the people on the fringes of what we call maybe respectable society. And I was wondering what, um, why you think it's important or what value you have to release, to make these stories now, especially in a time where our society seems to be moving towards this very corporatized, homogenized, kind of standardized madness. Yeah, um, good question. Um, well, I make all kinds of movies. I, you know, I act and direct in, in all kinds of projects. You, you quoted three that are, on, you know, or four that are kind of uh, on the more extreme right. side of the kinds of things I do. But um, yeah, but you also but, do Disney, which which is great because it makes you like a conduit, you know, into also mainstream. Yeah, exactly. So I, I so I think what you just said is um, one of the keys to maybe um, what I'm trying to do, um, mainly because um, I've found it's my voice. You know what I mean. So when you you know when you when one goes to a um, um, uh, MFA program of any kind, art, writing, directing, whatever. One of the things that you're taught is to look for your voice or try to find your artistic voice or your place. What can you do that, that others can't do? And um, so one of the things I found is that I'm in, a, I'm in an unusual position. I'm in um, this very um, commercial uh, uh, film world. Um, I'm in the pop culture world. Uh, as, a, as a performer, but um, I also have um, these interests that, you know, maybe don't, that, that are kind of tangents to that world, but don't really lie in that world. And so maybe my place, or my thing, or at least where I found a lot of, uh, where I can generate a lot of energy is to bring those two uh, worlds together. And so maybe, some of the things I'm doing, you know, I've been done before. It's just that, um, like, I'm sure there's been necrophilia movies before, but, you know, maybe they've been kind of relegated to some weird, um, you know, just relegated to kind of more fringe outlets. And, um, and so maybe it's um, my place to um, bring some of these ideas into uh, kind of more of a mainstream um, outlet. And, um, um, and, and, and why is it important? Well, it's important for the, what you said in the beginning, that um, it, making things, you know, homogenized is, um, it's dangerous, you know? We always, we always need, to, need to question it's not, you know, I, I'm not about, um, I'm not about anarchy, and you know, I, I um, appreciate structure, but we always need to question who we are and why we are, and um, 
and and how we view ourselves and 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 how we um, interact with each other. Those are always things that need to be constantly questioned. And I think that's you know one of the things that I that I try to do. Thank you. Um, next question. Yes, you. The mic is coming for you. Hi, James. Um, I'm not sure that all viewers, when they look at a film, um, consider what life lessons might be being delivered. Uh, but I know that some of my readers do look for life lessons in films. I also know that an artist doesn't necessarily feel obliged to deliver or to focus on what life lessons might be being delivered. But I wonder whether you've considered this and if so, what life lessons are you delivering in this film? Um, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, you're right. I don't, you know, when you make a piece of art or film, um, it's not, it's not always, you know, kind of a, a moral enterprise. Um, you know, we've, Films rest in a weird place, but you know where they're they're kind of for a long time they've been mass entertainment and um, um, and haven't had to you know kind of be burdened you know they they don't have to carry the 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 role of you know educational tools or moralistic tools at, at least is their primary function but um, and so when I make one um, it's and one like this you know. It, Primarily, I'm looking to um, um, do a do a portrait, uh, um, examine you know sides of you know what it is to be human um, through an extreme subject. But as far as you know, if I go back and look at it and say, well, um, what are the the lessons? Um, I guess I wouldn't say you know look at this film if you want to see you know. This isn't a film that will guide you to be um, a better, better person. It's not. It's not. It's not that kind of movie. But what it and, it and it and it also isn't saying you know things should be this way or things should be that way. But I think what it what I think is that, that it does is that that is maybe um, uh, very relevant. Is it shows okay? Here's a person that. Um, can't function in the in the inner in the in in civilized society. He's he's kicked off of the farm, goes to the cabin. He loses the cabin. He goes to the cave. So he's he's literally pushed further and further away from from civilization. And um, and you can you know that's a, I think that's a you know a relevant topic today. You know the way that we socialize. At least you know you could say that the inner circles of mainstream communication are so bound up in technology. You know that you that that it's that the way we socialize is so now intertwined with learning technological languages and social networking languages that there are you know many people that just you know. Give up. Don't want to do that. Don't engage with that. And so you could say that they are on the outer circles of um, this kind of, of communication. And it's only going to, you know, that kind of communication is only going to continue. And my, you know, my, the point of the movie isn't to say, well, you don't, you know, if you don't tweet or do Facebook, you're going to become a killer or uh, sleep with dead bodies. But it's, a, it's a, an extreme portrait of, wow, somebody on the outside. And so I don't know if that's, um, it's not a lesson per se, but it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a lens to kind of look at a, a phenomenon that um, is happening, you know, in our day and it's in its own new kind of forms and will, you know, continue to happen. People will be pushed outside of, of the inner social circles. We just have time for one more question. Um, there's so many hands. Um, yes, you. Could you bring the mic to this one? Your um, academic work is uh, really feeding your creative life. 
Um, could you say more about what your um, academic studies are uh, doing for you and whether you have any interest in bringing your creative life to scholarship and academic studies and how that relates to uh, the, everything you're doing and interested in? Yeah, it's a nice, yeah, nice question. I, I would say, um, I mean, because you asked, yes, I, you know, I, uh, I, like I was saying before, I, I, I do have my feet in different, different uh, spheres, and um, and so it's nice. It grants me a lot of freedom, and so when I uh, when I'm doing my academic work, I, you know, right now I, I'm preparing for my uh, oral exams for my. Uh, uh, English PhD and uh, sort of just reading a lot of books that I'll be questioned about but then I'll move on to my if I pass I'll move on to my dissertation and um, I think it will you know that will involve uh, it will involve American literature that's my specialization but also um, um, the way that these different mediums interact with each other so yes adaptation from literature to film but also, you know, the boundaries of the medium. What does what one medium do that um, better than the other? What can one do? How, how are we engaged with one compared to the other? Um, what is, you know, and, and thinking about them, you know, um, forms moving, being transformed into another one and back as kind of, um, translation, translation of media, um, rather than just thinking of, uh, about adaptation, which is, um, I, I, I feel like a look, kind of more limited view, but actually kind of looking at them as different kinds of languages. Um, and uh, so that will, I, you know, that's kind of my ap academic work, but I guess it's a way of saying, yes, I'm trying to bring um, all of my interests to, you know, to my academic work, and yes, you know, I think the films that I make are very informed by, also in, in turn informed by my academic work because, um, like I said, searching for my voice, I'd say, you know, it wasn't planned this way, but I'd say one of, you know, one of the things about my voice when I direct is that, yes, I like to adapt um, great literature, and um, that's just, and, but also kind of try and make it um, feel current or contemporary in other ways, whether it's, you know, the technology I use or the structure of the film or that kind of thing. So um, I guess that's a, I guess what I'm trying to say is, yes, I think my academic life is informed by my, my professional creative life and, and vice versa. Okay, um, well that's, uh, that's all for today. James Franco, thank you.